Hello and welcome to Access Chat. This week we're talking about accessible virtual learning environments. We're very pleased to have with us three guests. Um, it's uh, not often that we have so many guests at once. We're very lucky today. Um, so we've got Robert McLaren from Policy Connect who is responsible for the all, uh, helping coordinate the all-party parliamentary group on assistive technology. We've got Nicholas Matthias and Piers Wilkinson as well with us, uh, so we've, uh, who have also contributed to the, the work that Robert's been doing on, on the report that they put in on accessible virtual learning environments. So um, recently leg legislation's come into place that is requiring public sector websites to be accessible. This is European wide and we've taken the European legislation and made it into UK legislation. Uh, it's a huge amount of uh, web content out there that, that needs to be looked at, needs to be made accessible. Um, I, and I think it would be great to hear from Robert, Nicholas and Piers what they think about the current state of play, what they think the next moves are. So uh, if you want to lead first, Robert, that would be great to hear from you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, yes, so uh, the APPG for Assistive Technology, we uh, produced this report. Uh, which lots of people fed into and which uh, uh, Blackboard sponsored Policy Connect to do. Um, so, uh, thank you for that. Um, I was interested in uh, virtual learning environments before I was really made aware of the regulations, even from when I was a student. I'm dyslexic and had a lot of uh, dodgy PDFs to deal with. Um, and so, when I started to learn more about the regulations, I thought, here's something that could could move um, kind of a stubborn issue, which is virtual learning environments. And I think it's been a, a issue that's been hard to move because it has to be a university or college-wide approach. Um, there's only, you know, so much that can be done by uh, giving an individual access to support or assistive technology. And so, saw that opportunity potentially in the in new regulations to help bring focus. Uh, and energy behind uh, work on inclusive learning environments. And also, uh, I saw the, the regulations as something that would empower advocates of accessibility within universities. But when I go to conferences and meetings and speak to people, there's lots of people obviously working in universities, learning technologists, assistive technology officers uh, and tutors who see this as a problem, but are having trouble uh, raising it up the agenda of their organization and having uh, these regulations to point to and help um, help with their internal advocacy. So our first step with the report was to get clear on what universities' obligations are and start to raise awareness. And now we're in a phase of uh, some extent still doing that, but also um, working with universities on what they're implementation plans will be and, and helping to spread uh, good practice around that. That that's, sounds great. Uh, I also experienced the dodgy PDFs as you put them. Um, and for those that uh, don't understand what a dodgy PDF is, it's usually where someone's essentially turned a photocopy of your textbook into a PDF rather than actually creating a document with proper structure that can be accessed by assistive technology. So, um, Piers, what part did you play in, in, in the report and, and why is it important to you for assistive tech to be in, in virtual learning environments to 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 take that journey to be more accessible. Well, uh, I'll answer the second question first, if that's okay. Um, that's fine. It's important. It's important because um, pretty much, um, you know, since the DDA came in, you know, 23 years ago ish, um, universities of, uh, particularly universities, but across the education sector, it's been predominantly a, you know, a student by student case. You know, they'll uh, only ever implement. It's not been a sector wide uh, progress um, and very much it's, that came to light with the recent changes to DSA, and the way in which um, 
sort of provisioned for DSA found more, more on universities to provide. Um, and that sort of highlighted that universities were catering uh, predominantly to students on a uh, working it out on an individual basis. So there's a lot of disparity of accessibility across the sector, um, not only across the sector, across an institution, uh, quite predominantly, um, you know, you'll have one school in a uh, university or college where you know, one subject where it's, you know, it's a very good inclusive environment where they're able to talk to their students and able to sort of work with um, producing accessible content. And then, you know, it could be literally in the classroom next door, you've got the polar opposite where they've scanned their textbook, they've just uploaded it to a PDF and then they've just chucked it out in an email and hoping that everyone can access that. Um, so it, it's important in that aspect because we've got more and more disabled people going to you through edu education, more students uh, being recognised as having uh, specific learning differences and needing a more inclusive environment. So from sort of the background, it's very important that the standards have been um, sort of upgraded, as it were, with this new legislation. And then sort of the way in which I've fed into the report is um, I'm on the Disabled Students Campaign within the National Union of Students. Um, and it's meant that um, my sort of uh, colleague or one step up from me, Rachel, has sort of helped me become part of the Policy Network so that we were able to get across the need for it to be a top-down approach in universities and colleges um, rather than what it's currently, which is you've just got to hope that your lecturer or that your education provider is is on the ball or, or is open to suggestions rather than where, you know, currently I think Blackboard and GIS um, have got really uh, wonderful statistics in a, in a in a mathematical standpoint, um, beautiful to look at, but really when you, you put them in context, they're very hard hitting as to how different um, and how lack, how the gap between what a disabled student can access and what a non-disabled student can access, particularly with virtual learning uh, environment content, it became very much apparent that this work was needed. And then we basically provided a student perspective within the, the, the APGAT or APPGAT um, to sort of help make sure, as Robert said, it's an opportunity for those of us that have been working on this from a, from a student level, uh, from like a student union perspective, to be able to feed in and help drive the sector and the, the sort of the, the wider UK aspect and ensure that the legislation or the way in which it's implemented is less of a burden on disabled students planning and more of a duty of universities and colleges and institutions to be self-aware, to be self-auditing and to be aware of where they're currently failing and to meet the new uh, legislative requirement and ensure that disabled students aren't facing um, a gap in knowledge, a gap in education, a gap in opportunities because a lot of opportunities are sort of fed thread through the virtual learning environment at their unis. Um, and then also just to sort of make sure that um, they aren't also the ones that have to do all the legwork or uh, all of the work to sort of make things more inclusive. Or, uh, so that's sort of the background that um, myself and NUS have sort of put into the report and are continuing to work on raising awareness of the report as well. Thank you. Antonio, I know you've got something to say. Nicholas, you have you know, worked with Georgia Tech for some time, am I correct? Uh, yep, that is one of the institutions that I've worked for, that's correct. So Georgia Tech, they have you know, um, a very interesting approach to accessibility and inclusion. They do a lot of work in the area of robotics. You know, uh, what have you learned from the work that they have done there that you are bringing here to this you know, uh, uh, and share, share those best practices sure, yeah. with, your, with your colleagues here? Oh, uh, that was, um, yeah. okay. Sorry, would you, would you mind repeating the question? Oh, uh, but from your experience at Georgia Tech. Yeah, and I, I would I would actually um, open up my experience a little bit more. Um, so the so so I've been in educational technology for the last twelve years, and I've worked at various institutions uh, around the world. I've also worked at a few startups and. Accessibility was a theme that very consistently came back. And 
Um, what was interesting to me, and the reason why I think the the virtual learning environment angle to to this is so important, is that that tends to be the the biggest challenge that an institution has with regards to accessibility. Arguably, the content that lives within the virtual learning environment, the learning materials, are probably the most important content as far as the as far as the students concerned, and um, and it's a real challenge for um, for the institution because they're dealing with a very large amount of content. They're dealing with a large number of individual content creators, all of the all of the instructors that they ultimately don't have a lot of control over. So they've got this huge black box with with lots of content, um, lots of accessibility issues in there. It's very difficult for institutions to get a to get a handle on, even though that's the most important content, I would say. Um, so basically, and 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 what we see institutions do today, and this um, or up until very recently at least, is we see them be very reactive because of that, where essentially they require students to come forward to them so that they can then provide remediation that's required, which first of all, is it doesn't scale very well. It, it's kind of an expensive process. It's a slow process as well, as far as the student's concerned. Um, so, so I think there was a, there's a really strong need there for those institutions to become more proactive around this. Um, and in order for them to be able to do that, there's, they need tools uh, that allow them to do that. And that's, um, that was one of the reasons why I was one of the co-founders for Blackboard Ally, which is, um, the sort of the tool that sponsored this um, this report as well, but but next to next to having the tools to become more more proactive around this, I think the the sort of the directive and the the transposition transposition into law is important because it um, it just provides a a little bit more of an incentive for institutions. It sort of can help bump it up the priority list a little bit more. And we have seen that those countries where those those legal requirements exist. Uh, such as the U.S., it does help in sort of bringing it up on the on the priority list and giving it a little bit more attention. So that's that's kind of why I think it's important. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping with the um, with this coming in now is that we can we can use this as a as a lever almost to change the conversation to more of a um, rather than a, a remediation and an accommodation conversation, more of a universal turn it into more of a universal design conversation and how. Um, how improved accessibility can lead to higher quality course materials, more usable course materials in a way that can benefit all students. And that that kind of, that would help take this conversation out of the niche a little bit and, and into sort of more of the mainstream of what the institution does. And I think that's that's critically important. I think we can all think of, we can all think of lots of examples where improving the accessibility of a material ultimately leads to it just being higher quality and more usable for uh, for all students. And I think that's that's really, really important and I hope can, Become more and more a part of the conversation. Excellent. My point is, uh, my point oh, was in is that they have, you know, they have a, um, a history with accessibility, and they have a department focused particularly on on, on that. Do, do you think, uh, considering that where they are and what we have seen in other, in other universities uh, um, around the world, and, and particularly in the UK, there are other other places have something to learn from the way how they are structured? In terms of support, um, it's, it's so I, I actually did not directly work with the um, with the accessibility department at Georgia Tech, and I had a slightly slightly different role there. But um, I mean, I think I think the key is for um, so so institutions that tend to do a little bit better around this. They are they are the ones that do have. I mean, first of all, they they have people that kind of own this problem. That there's either a department or a set of people that are that are responsible for doing for doing better, but I think what's key and what a lot of institutions need to do better is is that it, this can't be limited to just a um, like a like a disability services department. Uh, they, they're typically um, quite disconnected from the institution, other than the requests they receive. And it's it's very important that they are they are well connected into into instructional design, that leadership um, so the leadership is buying into this and. Uh, that there's communication from the campus around it, that there's a policy, that there's uh, expectations that are being set with instructors on what they're expected to do. So, so being a little bit more, I think what's key if, at these institutions is that they, they need to internally be as connected as possible um, between the different parts of the institution so that this becomes a little bit more of a, um, sort, of, sort of, yeah, a little bit more of a mainstream activity almost. And also, also a continuous thing and, and that training the instructors rather than Fixing thing after fixing things afterward. That training instructors on how to create accessible materials from the beginning. Uh, that's the only way in which this can be become really sustainable. 
Okay, so I, I, this is a, this is uh, echoing a conversation that we actually had very recently around sort of accessible content and um, with Mike Gifford, where we were looking at um, Drupal and content management systems. Of course, you know, learning management systems are just big content management systems. They're just in a, a slightly different environment. Um, and we certainly see this in corporates as well. So um, what you see in universities is not dissimilar to, you know, large corporations also have a requirement to teach their staff stuff and the quality of the learning materials is varies tremendously. Uh, so, and, and that's because different individuals are taking different approaches to creating this stuff. So, so one of the things that was really discussed was how can we make it easier for people to create accessible documents? Uh, and, and the other, the other part was, um, around sort of, and, and how do we sort of automate as much of this stuff as possible so that, so that it's a in the workflow and B just happens because the reality is that not everybody's going to think about it as much as we can raise awareness we still need to sort of just make it happen in the background so so um is that something that you've been working on with with blackboard ally so yeah that that, that completely resonates with me i, I think I mean, there's a, just to give you a very quick, and I won't take too much time, but just to give you a very quick overview of, of how Ally works. So Ally is a, is essentially a tool that tries to um, make digital course content, digital course materials more accessible, um, and it but using a very universal design approach to that. And so in order to do that, it integrates very closely into the virtual learning environment. And then within the virtual learning environment, it does a number of different things. So for institutions, it's going to actually give them inside across their entire learning management system on how accessible their materials are, what some of the issues are, uh, how, how things are evolving over time, and the ability to, I think, stepping stepping aside uh, or sort of stepping away from Ally for a second, just generally being able to measure how you're doing and being able to understand where your issues are and, and use that use that insight to help inform sort of where to direct your where, where to direct your attention or your efforts, where who to target for. Uh, for some of that works for things like training, for things like outreach. I think the ability to measure is something that's been missing for a very long time and is now is now becoming possible with tools like Ally. Uh, so I think that's a very critical step. So that's one of the things that we that we provide. Uh, the second part that we provide is, is sort of the instructor facing side is that we'll, within the context of their course, we'll give them um, direct sort of feedback on how accessible their materials are and then also guidance to help help them make their materials more accessible. and. This all comes back to it is so important that this information is presented within uh, within the, within their workflow, with, where they're already spending some of their time doing some of their work, rather than them having to go to a separate system for accessibility. It's just kind of in there, and it's in their face, and it's it's in their course, and they can very easily tell which documents are are doing well from an accessibility point of view, which documents are not doing well. How can I fix it? And then the idea being that um, I mean, it's it's sort of there as a constant reminder when they engage with that and they actually fix something up, it, it just becomes part of their future workflow as well for future materials. So that's kind of the, oh, kind of the idea there. And we, we sort of see that as a, um, almost as a complement um, to any, any sort of face-to-face -face training that's, that's organized at the institutions uh, or something along those lines. And then the last part of what Ally does, and this comes back to the automation part, um, because, because I actually agree, I think the more of this that you can automate, the better place we'll be in. And, um, I mean, to, tooling is is critically important around this, and tools like like Microsoft Office are getting better uh, are getting better at this over time. But so the last part though, that we do with regards to students specifically is that we will automatically make a range of alternative formats, alternative accessible versions available for the students. So whenever they can get to the instructor's original, let's say it's a scanned PDF, for example, um, then immediately next to that, they'll also be able to get access to an OCR version of that, an HTML version, an EPUB version, an audio version, an electronic braille version, a translated version even, so that we can we can start to offer, and this, this all comes back to universal design as well, we can start to offer students different ways in which they can consume the content, which doesn't only benefit students with specific disabilities, but also allows someone that goes running, for example, to run to their, uh, to listen to their materials, someone that's 
um, like on a train, they can listen to their materials or they can put it on like an iPad or a Kindle or, and there's lots and lots of, of opportunities there. And it, it kind of helps broaden that, broaden that conversation a little bit. So that's, that's kind of what, what we do. But I think, I think those general concepts of automation is important as much as you can, at least uh, tooling is really important that it just becomes part of the workflow. And then uh, the ability to measure it and, and track it over time is critically important as well. Thank you. Um, so, Piers, from, from your point of view as a, uh, a representative of, of the students, how have you um, how have you come across the sort of the patchiness that has been described? Is that is that really representative of, of your experience of, of VLEs and of people think, using VLEs? I think um, generally there's a there's a there's a a large gap um, with what's accessible on VLEs, but it's also um, the integration of and the movement of moving more and more content, more and more processes onto VLEs. So um, I started university um, about five years ago. Um, and when I started, a lot of the administrative processes were still done via paper or via going to a building. Whereas now I've seen a huge jump in moving really, really important processes and really important documents onto the virtual learning environment or onto the um, online intranet. So this becomes an issue of, uh, of content being unavailable because to a certain extent, the people creating it have never been given the resources or the training or the, or the, the educational skills um, to produce the content and then because they've not been aware of it because they've not been uh, even you know notified that to a certain extent disabled students exist uh, in certain in institutions that um, you, you, you get a compounding effect you get where asking being able to ask for help requires you to have to overcome the barrier that you're asking for help with uh, for certain processes but it also sort of links into with automation it's really helpful. We've seen a huge, um, uh, you know, um, most of the studies that we either conduct or we view from external uh, bodies um, sort of highlight that the public opinion of students is they want this, all this content to be much more readily available and in formats that are much more um, diverse. Um, I think, you know, Nicholas said, about being able to go running. I mean, in my case, as a wheelchair user, that isn't my sort of uh, fun time, but it does mean that when I travel on trains for six hours, I can listen to it and not annoy all of the people around me, um, especially with movement towards things like Panopto and uptake of Panopto, it lets you capture recording items. But it does highlight um, when we talk to lecturers, um, I've been trying to do as much of that in the last couple of months as possible, talking to the staff members that are creating the content. And the one thing that I'm getting back more and more is why wasn't this a requirement in our certification process? Why wasn't this a requirement when we were in school? And it sort of leads to a wider discussion of inclusion within education. Um, we're talking about colleges and universities, but if you've got students coming up trying to access, disabled students trying to access material um, whilst they're at school, they're going to struggle. And then when they get to university, they don't know what they're supposed to expect. They don't know what they're entitled to have, such as alternative formats, such as available P uh, PDFs that have got uh, screen reader functionalities in included in. And it's very much a conversation that um, automation within the sector is very good because it, uh, especially with Blackboard Ally, it gives you uh, a very visual cue as to what's out there and what you should expect as a student. But when it comes to uh, education of um, what's what should be available or how to create content. Um, I think, as you were saying, um, within the, the wider sector, regardless of education, um, whether it's private corporations or businesses, there's a there's a diverse, very, very large gap in what's good and what's bad and what the training is available. And it reminds me of um, when I was going through my GCSEs for information technology. You know, we're taught how to write a word document but never once was it even introduced into the curriculum that um i might want to make sure that i'm using the right headings to make sure that a screen reader knows where things are on the page and it, it and i think 
there needs to be a comprehensive with this le new legislation that does only apply to post secondary education um, and public bodies. There, there should be a conversation about how do we make it a sustainable future? We can't entirely rely on automation. Um, whilst automation is good, it doesn't account for um, if a lecturer or a member of staff uploads a truly horrendous document that automation to a certain extent produces what looks to be more accessible content, but it can end up just causing your screen reader or an MP3 format to just scream at you, um, which is a very, very difficult thing for a student to then know what the issue was. Was it an automation issue? Was it a, hic uh, a glitch in the virtual learning environment? Or was it because the lecturer doesn't know to provide the resources or the, the, the layout or the, the template for that content? Um, so sort of to, like to sort of go back to um, one of the important aspects of the student experience is knowing that it shouldn't just be on a case by case basis is what we're currently facing and that it's not an IT problem. So quite often if a student has an issue, they'll contact a lecturer and they'll be told, oh, I think you might want to talk to IT. And then the IT department is like, we don't create content. We create, we work with Blackboard or we work with other providers to provide a space for content. Um, and it, I think it very much comes down to um, making sure that training is not just on a case by case level as well. So we talk about students not being given case by case support. Sh lecturers should also not be given a case by case training resource. It needs no. to be a comprehensive thing across the wider sector. Absolutely, and I think that's something that's been highlighted again and again in reports. You know, for example, when we were looking at dyslexia, the Rose report was quite clear that there was a need for teachers to understand about dyslexia as part of the the pedagogy and as part of the teaching process as you learn and, and, and train to become a teacher. I think it's really interesting that what uh, whilst we're, we're seeing this uh, work being done on virtual learning environments, we're also seeing a repeat of what I believe to be the mistake that's being constantly made, which is doing this in, in, in higher and further education and not looking at the pipeline. Because actually, um, and, I, I, and I know quite a bit about DSA, having worked in the DSA business for about a decade, some considerable time ago, but, but you know, understood that actually the people that were recipients of DSA were the lucky ones because they'd either had access to the technology or had access to the help to be able to get to the point that they could get to further education where suddenly there was an environment where you could get this assistive tech. Uh, whereas actually what you've got in, um, in the pipeline up to that is even more patchy provision of, of help and care and knowledge. So I think we need to be starting much, much earlier. You know, we need to be making these tools available in you know, primary schools and preschools and teaching the teachers on how to use it so that we can create this stuff. I think that luckily we're at a point in time where a lot of these tools are becoming embedded and the AI and other stuff is coming in that can help structure and give the metadata required for assistive technologies to interact well. And we had Mike Dolston on from Microsoft last week talking about um, immersive reader and, and learning tools in in uh, in the Microsoft products and Google are doing similar things. So I think this is positive and I think we're going to get that change. But you're right, we still need uh, a lot of education. And I think that's where groups like AVGAT can really help um, and, and really help inform the people that are making the policies. And maybe Robert, you'd like to, you know, come in and tell us a little bit more about what where you think you can influence and, and use the contributions of AppGet to influence that sort of decision making process before we we close. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think that's that's right. And picking up on some of the things that we've been talking about, it's sort of making accessibility visible, visible to the organization, as Nicholas was saying, so they can see what they've got. Um, visible to content creators because of course lots of people are uploading documents and, and they would uh, have, no, have no idea um, and instead of relying on the individual um, 
student to make things visible and chat about it for themselves. Um, one of the things that's coming forward from the report that, that I'm really excited about is a um, further and higher education led working group on regulations. So after the report, we created a GIST mail to oh, help people um, keep up to date with the um, with developments around the regulations. So for instance, oh, no, no a little while after the report came out, there was a further announcement from the EU about yep. uh, model accessibility statements and so on. But one of the things that so we, we had the GIST mail so that people could keep up with that. But one of the things that's come out of the GIST mail is that um, some people on it have, have formed a working group. Um, the initial suggestion came yeah. from, from Ben Watson at the University of Kent and uh, Kent has yeah. been working with JISC and, and other universities already on digital accessibility, he's been a bit, bit of a leader on it, as others have been, and have brought other people into this working group. What the people who are uh, yeah. in universities are doing is they're able to then create kind of uh, yeah, guidance and resources yeah. that are going to be really relevant to their yeah, sector. Yeah, I am, yeah, I just did some. And then yeah. what I can see as the role for the app guy going forward is to help uh, oh, link brilliant. in with well <laughs> Government Digital Service, the Quality Human Rights Commission, uh, the Department for oh, Education, yeah, Office of Students, those kind of official bodies, if you like, to look yeah, at the yeah. guidance and the resources oh, that the education yeah. sector is making for itself, along with um, with, with disabled students and, and students in general feeding into it, look at that and kind of uh, feed that into official guidance, yeah. if you like, because um, whilst it's great for um, the University of Kent and others to come up with resources and share it with some universities. We obviously don't want to see a situation where it's only the most um, motivated universities that ever see it or pick up on it. If that, if those leaders um, are to oh, spread that practice more widely across uh, further and higher education, they need a sort of a stamp of approval and they need to um, to be fed into the, to the official processes. So, you know, one thing, I'll just say some of the things I would like to see um, come out of it. You know, one thing I'd like to see is is the Equality and Human Rights Commission have a have technical guidance for further and higher education on the Equality Act, and this regulation, this new regulation, references the Equality Act, so that if an organisation doesn't meet the accessibility requirement of the new regulation, then it counts as them failing to make a reasonable adjustment under the Equality Act. So it makes sense to me for the technical guidance that the Equality and Human Rights Commission produce, it makes sense for that guidance to be now updated, take into account um, yeah. the new regulations and give a lot more specificity around digital accessibility. Similarly, um, Government Digital Service have already put out guidance around regulations yeah. um, for the public sector in general. I think one of the things that's come out of this conversation is there's lots of specific issues yeah, for education um, and while some organisations might be able to take a look at the legislation, hand it to their webmaster yeah, and no, ask that person to get going with it, that's of course not possible within further higher education. Every uh, member of the academic staff is a content producer and that creates a completely different challenge and so sector specific guidance no, from right. Government digital service is something that we've recommended in the report, yeah. and I think there's Good a sure. there's an Brilliant. opportunity for Absolute the pleasure. sector yeah. created yeah. guidance to then feed its way into government digital service official guidance. Yeah, I think that's great. Antonio, did you have a comment? Yeah. So uh, no, today we have so many you know uh, technologies available for us, you no know, uh, instant me messaging, social networks. What do you think? Uh, how can uh, these uh, advocacy groups around students, around universities, uh, can grow and bring people together in order to reinforce uh, uh, you know, an appeal for, for their rights and to make sure that you know, they, they can succeed and students that are going to come to university next year will succeed as well. So what's need to be done from the uh, advocacy side to reinforce the work that you are doing? Um. Basically, um, there's always been a sort of collective national students group. Um, we've got disabled students officers in um, student unions around the country from FE to uh, HE. Um, NUS has recently um, 
brought in the apprenticeships as well. The apprenticeship, uh, National Society of Apprenticeships, I think uh, they might actually have an issue if I get that wrong. Um, but it's it's generally it's about collectively working together. Um, unfortunately, one of the the issues that we're having um, with social media, as you say, is that, for example, Twitter has the ability to have alternative text to images. Um, but at the moment, we're struggling with Instagram and the sort of, um, you know, I, I'm not a user of Instagram. I don't feel like I'm one of those cool people. Uh, but it's becoming more and more obvious that there needs to be more functionality in our social media so that we can have a collective movement that isn't always accidentally treading on each other. Um, and additionally, um, NUS is very much, especially the Disabled Students Campaign, is very much um, something that we implore volunteers to get involved with, specifically disabled students. Um, and on your campuses, maybe support, have the student unions and have uh, volunteer groups support disabled students much more. It isn't a fight that, you know, advocacy isn't a fight that we can win by ourselves, uh, particularly because um, rather, unfortunately, most of what we want to do and what we need to do are meetings in buildings that are still inaccessible physically, meetings that are difficult to get to, and it can't just be up to us as the disabled students do to advocate for it. Very much is a collectivism that we need to do. Um, and to sort of add on to the way in which the, the public pressure, um, it's not just students that need to get on board with this. Um, if universities and colleges and public bodies meet these new guidelines and these new standards in a positive way a, rather than a reactive way, it's going to move the entire private sector up to it as well because they won't want to fall behind. So it's going to not just help disabled students in the country, this, these legislations, the virtual learning environments aren't just about disabled students, it's very much about the local community, um, disabled people across the country access opportunities hosted by community projects within colleges and universities. So I think it, it really is just, you know, doing your Google search, doing your, your social media search for the student groups because they're very welcoming, particularly the disabled student groups, if I am a little bit biased. Um, and it's very much about just starting that step, starting that conversation because if we all get together and we're all in the room, we're all having these conversations, we also learn more about each other, which I think is something that we're really missing at the moment. It is very much a conversation about very specific um, adjustments, such as closed captions or screen reader technology, when there are many more different reasonable adjustments that need to come in and need to be discussed about within the movement. Um, so if, if that answers your question, I hope. Okay. No, no, that, that that perfect because that's that's somehow you know from someone I, I follow the development of a few universities particularly in in UK and sometimes I I, I, I realize that people are having uh, the same conversations in different places but there's nothing that is bringing them together in one place sometimes they don't even know that they exist the existence of each other and I think that they could win if they were able to collaborate more. Uh, uh, in, in relation to the topics that they are passionate about and in, in order to achieve their aim. So we are about to close down. It was you know, a very interesting chat and you know, particularly important in the area of uh, education. We'd like to say thank you to our uh, to Barclays and our clear test for all the support that they provide us uh, every week. And I would like to invite everyone to join us next Tuesday at 8 p.m. London for uh, a Twitter chat. I'm sure it's going to be particularly interesting, so you have the chance to, uh, to, to join and engage with our guests that we have here today. So thank you so much, everyone.